everyone. Uh, I'm Connor Flora. If you don't know me, but I figure everyone does by now. Um, our topic this week is wounds. Um, so let's start with the case. Um, so we have a 48 year old undomiciled man. He comes in with a deep abrasion. He tells you that he fell off his bike while he was riding on New York Ave, which is the avenue that has all the um, the garbage trucks on it. Um, and these are his vital signs. They got a finger stick and this is past medical history, diabetes and hyperlipidemia. He also lost his meds a few days ago because they were stolen. He got placed in the pods. It's late. You're working overnight and you pick him up. Um, he doesn't have any other injuries. Do you have any questions? When did it happen? Uh, around like several hours. several hours ago, like 6 p.m. Did he hit his head? Uh, he did not hit his head. No. Um, it's dried blood. Yeah. How's his bike? How's his bike? It's for, it's still there. He wasn't going very fast. He was like going less than 15 miles per hour. Uh, and he was wearing a helmet. Um, so physical exam, uh, which is the next part. Um, his ABCs are intact because this is a trauma. Um, his head and neck, no concerns regular heart and lung exam, abdomen soft and non-tender, MSK and skin, he's got, uh, he, he's moving all four extremities. His right knee has some limited flexion and he's got a six by eight centimeter deep abrasion on his right shin um, that looks like it's contaminated with either fecal matter or dirt. Um, and he has no focal neuro deficits. What do you want to do? All right. Yeah. Um, so you got some labs just because his sugar was high on the finger stick. Um, what's our plan? Besides cleaning. Okay. I think mean, you have to consider uh, if you were to give a couple minutes to get some Yeah. Yeah. So a big wound like that, you have to consider if you're paying some clothes or irrigate. Yes. Pretty much driving home in men. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're definitely going to uh, irrigate. New York streets are also really gross. So we're going to give a tetanus uh, prophylaxis, either immunoglobulin or a toxoid vaccine. And we're going to give pain control. We also should probably antibiose if it is a contaminated stool contaminated wound. Um, we want to give broad spectrum antibiotics. And thinking about his uh, meds that have been stolen, are you just going to send him home after you give him antibiotics? What's, what's his disposition? It's the middle of the night. He's undomiciled. Consult social work. So we want to think about like making sure he has these, he has the he has a way to get the uh antibiotics or at least give him a first dose. Um because he is someone who has a high likelihood of pro, um moving on to getting a more severe infection. Um because he might not be able to take all of his uh, medications. So the topic of my clinical pearl is when is acute wound antibiosis appropriate and warranted? Um, so when we talk about wounds, there's two different kinds of, there's different ways to classify. We have acute wounds versus chronic wounds, and then we have open and closed, which we've kind of talked about today. But uh, acute wounds um, 
are uh, basically over the course of the last like 12 to 24 hours. And then a chronic wound is a uh, wound that has been open or longer lasting and it has an impaired healing process and is a more prolonged and extensive inflammatory phase. Um, this will involve a decube ulcer, a vascular ulcer, diabetic ulcers. Then open versus closed, is there skin breakage or is there not skin breakage? Um, so bugs are everywhere. We're learning more and more about the microbiome of the world and ourselves. Um, but we want to think about um, colonization versus contamination. Uh, chronic open wounds are considered colonized and antibiotic therapy should really only be reserved for um, when we're concerned for uh, imminent infection or current infection. Um, so a chronic uninfected wound should not warrant antibi antibiosis. Um, if we're going to be initiating empiric antibiotics, we're considering uh, the severity trajectory, the likely pathogens based on anatomical source and also contamination source, um, and expected resistance patterns. And because we want to practice good microbial stewardship, antimicrobial stewardship. Um, this is just a statistic about uh, traumatic wounds in the ED. They have a three to five percent infection rate. Um, these are some wound characteristics that we want to that we want to think about when we're deciding whether or not to antibiose. Um, certain mechanisms, such as crush, burn, road rash, or bites, might want us might uh, ping us to think about antibiosing. Um, contamination, either visible or um, if this happened, uh, if there is contamination with uh, fresh water or uh, coastal waters. And then if this happened outside or with a um, dirty instrument, we want to consider antibiosis. Uh, we want to look at how um, deep did the wound go, um, if it penetrated down to bone. And then we also, if there's an implanted foreign body that might be difficult to remove, um, that can potentially serve as a nidus for infection. So that should make us decide whether or not we want to, that should make us start to consider antibiosis. And then if there is an open fracture, we are concerned for progression to osteomyelitis. Um, poorly vascularized areas of the uh, body. Um, if there's a wound in this area, um, we want to think about potentially antibiosing. Um, if there are, if there's a proximity to an exposed, if there's an exposed joint or proximity to a lymphedematous area, that should also prompt us to consider antibiosis. And then if the wound is in an area that is um, known to be regularly, uh, uh, known to be not necessarily contaminated, but um, colonized by a lot of bacteria, we want to think about antibiosis like the armpits, genitalia, fatty folds, or the feet. Um, and then specific patient characteristics. Um, so like thinking about the overall patient, um, extremes of age, uh, patients who are immunocompromised, um, these should make us think about giving prophylactic antibiotics. Um, specifically with immunosuppression, uh, just something that I learned while I was reading, um, they might not necessarily mount a fever or have a elevated white count, but we can look at their uh, we we can look at their glucose levels, and hyperglycemia can be a useful marker for active infection versus um, whether or not it's just a contaminated wound. Um, patients with uh, as far as the clinical picture goes, patients with diabetes, uh, peripheral vascular disease, uh, venous insufficiency they um, might be more likely to progress to a um, more systemic infection. So we should consider antibiosis then as well. Um, and then pregnancy is a relatively immunocompromised state. So we want to be mindful about the safety of the antibiotic that we're considering, but um, that should also uh, uh, sort of make us start to consider uh, prophylaxis. Um, and then we also want to think about social factors, like in this case, 
Um, can they care for their wound adequately when they leave the ED? Um, or can they like really, uh, ca can they get the antibiotics quickly if they leave? Um, so we wanna consider about whether or not whether we're sending them home right away, whether we're getting them a social work um, consult. Uh, and then some guidelines. Um, the ID Society of America um, recommends uh, basically cover for uh, skin flora. Uh, and they, sorry, they don't necessarily have a prophylaxis for wounds overall, but they do make recommendations for um, uh, combat wounds, which kind of um, applies to some ED wounds that we see that are acute, uh, such as like GSWs, fight bites, or stabbings. Um, and their key points are coverage for coagneg staph and uh, staph aureus. Pseudom cover for pseudomonas in eye trauma and burns and cover for anaerobes when there's peritoneal thoracic or uh, CNS um, penetration. Um, but the, the gist of it is to uh, for the EMS to cover with a sterile bandage, then to irrigate with NS when they come in and then to breed and remove um, foreign bodies and give cefazolin and antibiotics ideally within three hours of the injury. Um, and then these are the recommendations for the um, actual antibiotics. Um, for what Tintinale teaches, um, the, the goal is to meet a high blood level as quickly as possible, um, but there's no benefit to continue really beyond 24 hours of antibiosis. Um, it's, it's, uh, stated to start antibiosis before to tissue manipulation, which in practice, I don't, I've never seen that. Um, and you want to use specific agents to practice good antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and then, uh, administer in a rapid route. That's either IVs were taught the most rapid, but if you give PO antibiotics early enough that um, can be essentially equivalent. Um, and then irrigate with like more than seven PSI um, until debris is gone. And then you also wanna specifically use pseudomonas coverage for specific, for, for plantar puncture and then freshwater con contamination, Vibrio coverage for coastal water contamination and prophylactic antibiotics in all human bites. And then for all mammalian bites, overlying hands and joints, and then anything that is physically contaminated. Any questions? Cool. Uh, these are just some quick takeaways. Um, you wanna, look for signs of active or imminent infection when you're thinking about warranting whether or not you're going to do antibiosis, but also be good antibiotic stewards. Consider wound characteristics and patient characteristics on deciding whether or not to use antibiotics. Um, and then uh, remember the patient's um, social situation when you're deciding on disposition. Um, and here's the feedback code. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm Carl. Um, today, we are going to uh, talk about a topic that Dylan briefly mentioned. Uh, and I want to start with a case. So there is four participants to this case. The first one is Max. He's a very good boy. That's good to know. This is Josh. He's also a very good boy. There's a third participant, and that's the older brother. And he's not. He's like all older brothers are pure evil, you know. So he likes to mess with them both. So he yanks Max Dale one beautiful summer evening, and then this happens. And the fourth participant is you. Okay. Josh is sitting with his mom. He's got this on his leg. And then what are we doing? So I want I want to know which questions to ask and what is your guys' approach to this? How long ago was it? So it was around two hours ago. Any other questions? 
Yeah, the dog, the dog is living the full, you know, suburban lifestyle, so he's full vaccinated. <laughs> One more time. Here we have a story. Yeah. The dog yeah. 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 No, the kid is fine. He's also pulled up to date on vaccines. Other questions? Any other side of the question? No, just you do a full physical exam. That's the only thing you find. Okay. So, um, as mentioned, today's topic will be mammalian bites, and we will go through specific questions to ask. Like how, how to do a focus physical exam, imaging when to get, imaging and not, like labs, cultures, and then like briefly mentioned like post-exposure, prophylaxis for tetanus and rabies, when to give antibiotics and which antibiotics to choose, and when to suture and not. So just some basic facts. So there's, it's actually very common every year, like over a million people get bit by animals. And these actually lead to 10,000 admissions every year and up to 1% of ED visits are due to mammal, mammal bites. Hands are the most common location, like that makes sense, you know? And these can be more dangerous, especially like in larger animals, larger dogs. So injured to tendons, muscles, bones, skulls. And every year, unfortunately, around 10 to 20 kids die from animal bites. So animal bites, uh, this is kind of a scary picture, but dog bites have the highest crush injury rate and the highest risk for neurovascular damage. Less infection risk compared to cats who cat bites can penetrate very deep and kind of inoculates the bite because the teeth kind of looks like an eel, right? So it's much higher risk of infection. And then the New York fiber animal that doesn't break the mesh. <laughs> rats, so rat bites, they carry this risk of like causing rat bite fever or streptococcosis, which is covered by penicillin, which is good. We'll come to that. And then the, the most dangerous mammal to us humans is uh, us, other humans, right? <laughs> exactly. So I chose to split here uh, human bites into occlusal bites and fight bites. So occlusal bites are here like, like you chomp somebody, chomp somebody. <laughs> and these can be signs of child abuse, right? If, if toddlers bite each other, that's fine. But if like the uncle bites the kid or something, that's, that's not okay. So one way to kind of see if this is an adult bite or not is to measure the like the distance, the distance between the cat, the canine teeth, the first four are incisors, right? And then you have your canine teeth. If it's more than three centimeters, that's an adult bite. Okay. Uh, and these are like not super deep, but human flora is the best flora to infect other humans. So you want to give antibiotic coverage to all bites that are not like toddler biting each other and it's very, very um, shallow. And then I chose to bring up fight bites. I mean, is it really a bite, you know? But these get infected a lot. And it's super important to do like a good exam, check all the joints, check all the tendons, right? And provide adequate coverage. And also with all humans, you need to worry about HIV and hepatitis B and other like bloodborne pathogens as well. So specific questions to ask. We, we actually mentioned previous, uh, we actually mentioned this one, very good. And this it was kind of obvious here, and this we mentioned. You know, we mentioned both dog and rat. It was super nice. And then this is important because it will, uh, if you don't clean it right away, delayed presentation and like leaving the wound dirty is increasing like the risk of infection. So physical exam, I chose to go like a stepwise uh, approach here. So first, you need know, to start with the ABCs, right? If it's like actively beating a lot. You need to stop the bleeding. You need to like apply direct pressure. Maybe like if it's severely bleeding, like think about a tourniquet. So then you need to check the like neurovascular impact, right? You do the, all the movements against like active, progressive flexion, for instance. You check the capillary fill. You check the pulses. Like you do a good neurovascular exam. If you find anything concerning, finding anything lacking in the neurovascular exam, then probably a surgeon might need to be involved. And then. You need to clean it, like you need to clean it and irrigate it, irrigate, 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 like lots of pressure, pressure, pressure. So here he's using like the kind of pressure with the splash guard, that's the best. 
just squeeze really hard. And then you can also check how deep it goes, like using a Q-tip or something similar, you can measure it. You need to explore the wound to make sure that if you see any foreign bodies, you need to remove them. But you won't always see all of them. And that's when we think about imaging. So we check, think about x-rays for several reasons, the like crush injuries, big dogs, you know, John. Uh, we, fix, uh, we use x-rays to like look for teeth fractures, more common or teeth fragments, like more common from cat bites. <clears throat> and this, this is a case that I wanted to bring up. There's several case reports like this. So think like small child, big dog, injured to the head, right? You look, it looks fine, but there's actually a depression fracture in the skull. So the skull bone has a hole in it, which is a notice for infection. And this happens because we missed it, right? So this doesn't, this doesn't look like a good like nervous, but like neurologic outcome to you, probably not, right? So you don't want to miss it. Yeah. So infection-wise, um, we talked a little bit about prophylaxis. So this, I'm just going to like briefly talk about tetanus and rabies. This is like the classical tetanus picture. So if the tetanus vaccine was given like more than five years ago, or they're, or if like they're like doc, I don't know. Like maybe it was four years ago, but I don't really remember. Just give it. And rabies, you need to ask about questions about the animal. Was the pet or like was the royal raccoon or something on the on the street, right? That makes a huge difference. If you're unsure, you can check with like NYDOH or like ask her attending. Um, yeah. And rabies, I won't like go super much into that, but you may need IVIG. Um, and then antibiotics. So most animal bites require some sort of antibiotic coverage, right? Especially, especially if they're like deep bites, especially if they come with a delay presentation, and especially, especially if they're they are close to danger zone, hand joints, AB fistulas, like a prosthetic joint that they the surgeon just put in, things that will like have severe, uh, severe things happen if you miss it. Um, and then if it's like for prophylactic purposes, you can consider a shorter course, like five days. But if you have active signs of infection, then you need a longer treatment duration. And like if the infection is pretty bad, if they're septic, if there's septic arthritis or something, or if it's like in the skull or something, then you might consider IV antibiotic treatment. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk a little bit also about the bugs that we cover with uh, our antibiotics. And for cats and dogs, but especially cats, Pastorella, Multacida pastorella species is the most common cause of infection. So according to one study I read, 75% of cat bites, like when you do the culture, grow pastorella. Some of them also grow like staph and strep, but like if I swab myself and send, it probably also won't grow staph and strep. Right? And the worst thing to know is penicillin BK provides excellent coverage for pastorella, right? Better than Keflex. Keflex does also cover it, but penicillin BK does an excellent job of killing this particular bug. And this is important because I'm coming to this my, uh, my spicy Swedish slide now. So for cat, for humans and dogs, right? I'm also, yeah, hundred percent. Like I'm also with the cats, but But the Swedish, Norwegian, and Danish guidelines all recommend penicillin VK for prophylactic coverage for cat bites for exactly this reason, right? And you may like let's just think about it. You may talk to your pharmacist about it. If if it's a healthy young individual and it's a non-dangerous location, right? And they're going to listen to you. And they're like, if the other pictures come back, it might be something to think about, right? Um, and then we talk about sutures. So in general, we don't suture animal bites. And then I have tried to like draw a Y. When you suture it almost superficially, what you're doing is you're creating this dream blood agar plate for like bacterial infections, right? So if you suture animal bite, it triples the infection rate. So on the suture, if it's like going to get like, look super ugly, if it's on the face, right? You don't suture hands or feet, you don't suture them in the hand first people. So there's like lots of things that has to be like fulfilled for you to be able to suture it safely. And if you suture something, you just need to give like augmented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just like uh, to recap, we stop the bleeding, we do ABCs. We check for neurovascular defects. We clean, irrigate, irrigate, irrigate really well. And we get imaging if we think we, they need it. And then we think about all the infections that may like occur after this bite. And then we usually leave it open for secondary healing. Yeah. Okay. So I talked really fast. So we have actual time to kind of read, like come again to this case. So if I ask one more time, what are we doing, Josh?
One more time. Exactly. Clean up the mouth. It is a dog bite. It is pretty, so it needs some network coverage. And dogs, the flora, like it's similar to human flora and like infection risk. So you will get augmented. Um absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, the wound is not bleeding. So the ABC is intact. You do that x-ray, you check for teeth fragments, you check for anything that wasn't anything. You don't suture it. You give adequate coverage with augmented versus dog bite. Everybody's vaccinated, dogs vaccinated, cars vaccinated, nobody needs any more vaccines. You give return precautions, right? If your hands are stingling, if it's cold limp, anything like that, if it starts getting infected, just come back. This, you need to do this for all animal bites, apparently in New York State. So you go, you just Google NOI, like POH, animal bite, and this website pops up and you just call it and send it. And uh, the older color is grounded for all these evil deeds. <laughs> yep. <laughs> These are my references. And... Okay. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm also a new intern. Um, and I'm just going to briefly go over laceration repair. Uh, I apologize if some of the content I review is a bit redundant to our earlier lectures. So as we know, lacerations are a very common presentation in the ED. And in an article in 2019, it was about 8.2% of ED visits. So it's something we'll see often. Uh, this presentation will just review the initial assessment, preparation, closure techniques, and then close close post-closure follow-up care. So our case, it's a 25-year-old female, no past medical history. She presents to the ED for evaluation of a right hand laceration. Biters are stable. She says she was playing in a park and tripped and cut her hand on a fence. So the initial assessment, you start with like every patient, you want a good history. Things to focus on in lacerations are the mechanism of injury. What caused the cut? Is it a material that can fragment? Um, the timing of the injury, how long ago did this happen, any associated symptoms, and also any medical conditions that might have caused the trauma. Um, and, you know, you want a good medical history, any comorbid conditions that could change management as well or impair healing times, and then their tetanus immunization status. And then for the physical exam, obviously, you want to visualize the wound well. You want to make sure you can see injuries to any underlying structures. Um, you want to do a good neurovascular neurovascular exam, check for cap refill, pulses, range of motion, strength. So just get a really deep, uh, as with any patient, a very good history physical exam. Um, things to consider, anything that'll increase infection risks, like we've talked about before, extremes of age, comorbid conditions, um, gaping wounds, wounds with a lot of contaminant. Um, in a delayed presentation, you could look for signs that infections have already um, set in, such as abscess, pus, uh, dimpling of the skin. And then, you know, if you're worried about any sort of further injury beyond the laceration, do you need imaging or do you need any consults? So after you've done that, you want to clean and prep the wound. You just sort of covered irrigation, but obviously pressure is really important. High pressure syringe is sounds like the best option from the attendings here. Antiseptic solutions that get into the, like, you want to be careful of those because if they get into the wound, they've shown to be um, that they can impede healing and also increase risk of infection. Um, and then you also want to make sure you deep breathe and explore the wound as well um, to make sure it's really clean because the most important thing is preventing infection. And then for anesthetic, um, we have a couple of different options. You can do injectable like lidocaine. If you think it's going to be, take a, be a longer procedure, you can do something like bupivacaine, which is longer lasting. Um, just to note that it's contraindicated in pregnancy. If it's an area of the body where you're worried you won't be able to do local injection, you can do nerve blocks. Um, and then if it's a special population like pediatrics, you can try something topical like LET followed by lidocaine. Um, also behavioral modification like giving like a, a t like a phone so they can watch a movie or, or something to distract during the repair. Um, if you really think they can't tolerate it, you might have to consider procedural sedation. Uh, just, I want to comment briefly on a complication of anesthesia or local anesthesia. It's last syndrome, local anesthesia, systemic toxicity. Um, it's very rare, but very dangerous if it happens. Um, the symptoms will be fairly quickly and they'll be uh, neurologic and, cardi and cardiac in nature. Um, and then treatment will be uh, a three-pronged approach. It's just ACLS, seizure management, and then uh, lipid emulsification. And obviously you want to start that very quickly.
So after you've cleaned and prepped your wound and made sure you haven't overdosed them on local anesthesia, you move on to closure. Again, we talked about this earlier, but types of closure, and that depends on the age of the injury as well as the mechanism and degree of contamination. The only contraindications to closure are cellulitis or abscess. So beyond that, it'll be clinical judgment. Most, uh, most wounds that present early and are fairly clean, you can do primary closure. Oh. Um, secondary is when it's very contaminated or pre presented very late or very deep and you can't irrigate it well. And then you're just gonna let it here by scar formation, which is sort of a poor cosmetic outcome. And then delayed primary closures if they present late. And I've seen different data on this, but up to date says for the face, you can close up to 24 hours and then anything else up to 18. After that, it's a delayed presentation. Um, then you wanna clean it, pack it and reassess in four to five days. And again, sorry for the repetition. So sutures, sutures are a good option for most wounds, low tension, high tension, linear, irregular. Um, it can, and they have good cosmetic outcomes. The only real time you really wanna avoid suturing is like we said, infected or contaminated wounds. If they have any medical conditions that could impede uh, wound healing, you might need to consider alternatives to sutures. And then I've seen, like I've noted, like if they've had a prior allergic reaction to suture repair, which I've not heard of, but it was mentioned, you would obviously want to avoid. And then for sutures, you obviously have your absorbable and non-absorbable. Absorbable are better for patients where you're worried that they won't return or it'll be difficult to remove the sutures um, or if it's a deep suture. Um, if you're doing the face, the fast absorbing gut is a good option because it'll fall off within seven days and it's good for scarring or it minimizes scarring. And then for suture size, um, you wanna use the smallest suture that will allow for good uh, closure and cosmetic outcome because the larger the suture, the more trauma to the skin. So I think the face, you can usually use a 5-0 or a 6-0 and then in the rest of the body, usually a 4-0 is a good option as well. Up to date says proline is the best because it's um, it expands more with the skin, so like it accommodates for more swelling. Other options are adhesive strips. They're good for small superficial wounds. They're good in the elderly patients where the skin's um, less tolerant. Uh, tissue adhesives is also another option for uh, low tension areas, linear uh, linear wounds, and in pediatric patients. If you're using something like Dermabond, you just want to make sure you go three to four times over the wound to achieve good closure. Obviously, these aren't good for any high tension wounds, wounds that required layered closure, irregular wounds. They're also safer options because you're not exposing you or the patient to a sharp. And then staples are most often used for scalp lacerations. Um, they're quick and easier to use, but they, have, they don't allow you to approximate the wound as well. They don't have as good uh, cosmetic outcomes. Um, and also they can hurt more upon removal. So just one note, this is a micromend. Um, so this was a study published about a year ago about using micromend for small lacerations in the ED. It was a very small study. And basically what you do is you um, take one end of the micro staple, you anchor it, approximate the wound, and then seal it on the other side. So it might be an option in the future to for small lacerations that it's uh, as, a, as opposed to sutures, it's a little less riskier and more comfortable for the patient, but obviously there needs to be more research on it. Um, so aftercare dressing, uh, you wanna keep the area moist for good healing. Um, you can put like a topical antibiotic ointment on it. For uh, non-absorbable sutures, you want 24 to, to, you want about 24 hours of keeping it dry, absorbable, I've seen up to 48. Some people say keep it dry until you fall until they fall off. But then after 24 hours for non-absorbable, you can start sort of wash an area with soap and water. Obviously, you want to evaluate for tetanus. If they have if they're not up to date on vaccines, you want to update it. If they've never had a vaccine, they might need immunoglobulin. Um, Follow-up removal, it's very patient location dependent. Uh, simple lacerations shouldn't need follow-up unless you're removing, unless you need to remove the sutures. Um, and then it's really going to be just based on patient and where it is on the body and provider uh, preference. And then obviously you just wanna like alert your patient to any complications that can happen and, and strict return precautions. Um, so like if the ends of the wound are necrosing, signs of infection, 
uh, for wound healing. You just want to alert them to that so they know when to come back in. Okay, so back to our case um, for the initial assessment. I guess if you guys were presented with this laceration, what would you want to know besides what I told you already? It was within the last hour, we'll say. So again, this seems like a pretty straightforward wound. Like there's no complicating factors, no comorbid condition. It looks pretty linear. It is in a high tension area, but it's not too deep. Um, and she doesn't know when her last tetanus was. And obviously for the physical exam, she was neurovascularly intact. So irrigation, how would you guys want to irrigate this wound? High pressure, you can use the uh, syringe. You can use tap water, saline, whatever your preference. Uh, anesthetic, you could probably just do lidocaine here. She's old enough that she should be able to tolerate it. Um, and, and along the wound edges. Any preference for closure? What sutures you would use, what size? Okay, so probably like a 5 I think a four is that small, you can get away with three It's a high tension area. What 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 can the amount of force that the that size suture can can handle? That's uh that's fine. It's too high tension, it's not gonna want to handle from a um uh small and yeah. Would you do like a Horizontal mattress or something. You could definitely consider in a spot like that doing mattress. Yeah. You definitely could. You don't need them all as mattress. You can put it in one mattress and then do the rest as simple interrupted. Personalize the whole together. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of, of, of placing deep normal sutures. In a spot like that, it, it, it's not that deep. The problem is the tension. So that the mattress is going to be able to get A lot of people will use the mattress sutures. In order to bring the, the deep the deeper thing. I like making my the when I putting in my simple interrupted sutures that is already very shallow when I'm doing it, so it's way less tension on the wound and, and less of a space for uh, for fluid to collect and um, either infection or just to to, to cause pain into the wound. Um, so if you if you close that space with these uh, with deep sutures, however many layers you need, the it's going to be much easier to put in the the, the simple sutures afterwards. Um, especially when they place like the thigh or the leg or the arm, which can be pretty deep. So you put in several layers of deep, and even on the face, you should, you should probably do it. If you look at, at um, I have a partner who's a plastic surgeon. I don't know if he was serious, but he told me once he never does less than five layers of closure on the face. I almost can't walk. And he also has got a lot of loops and glasses and whatever. He's, <laughs> okay, but I'm not saying you do five layers of closure on the face, but honestly, you should probably do for most wounds, you should probably do at least um, one uh, layer. Great, you guys fixed her hand. Good job. Um, they just did simple, interrupted. Um, any discharge instructions? So, seven to ten days. Uh, you know, topical antibiotics. Um, yeah. And just so that, that like this is this doesn't sound like important, but actually measuring the size of the wound and documenting that is actually a big difference. The difference, um, you know, it goes by um, the size of the wound in terms of billing. So the difference between a 2.5 centimeter wound and a 2.6 centimeter wound is hundreds of dollars. And then the next cut off, I think, is seven and a half centimeters. I'm not, I don't remember. So I mean, just don't lie. Just, but um, just so you know, all four by fours have um, measuring on the side of it. You
Uh, if you wanted to do uh, a nerve block, instead of doing local energy here, we have a nerve block that you can say. Yeah, radial nerve block, yeah. right? So they're easy to do for nerve blocks are really easy, facial nerve blocks are really easy. So I'm a big fan of doing nerve blocks where we can. You can use much smaller amount of anesthetic, much less risk of toxicity, you can get a much bigger area of anesthesia. You're gonna do less swelling around the fat, less edema, so that way you have a better contact with yourself when you're sewing. I think this I would do a nerve block just because trying to get anesthesia into that wound, it's gonna manipulate the wound that's gonna make it much harder to close, and it's gonna happen to look as nice afterwards. So if you do a um, a radial nerve block for this, um, or I, or any the old stock kind of nerve blocks are fairly easy for the forearm. Um, it it will create the anesthesia you need, and it will be much easier. I would also anesthetize before anesthetize before cleaning. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. For scalp labs and your scapely, do you do lidocaine and masking powder? Yeah, I think that's a lot of these days. But in the conversation, I would say shit. I would do it with the fish. Yeah, the conversation. If you're doing it for staple, this idea is you know that after we stick you into lights, I just sat at a room and then do this. Some patients get just scared and they get a scare. Other patients just say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to get it. Three little sticks as opposed to three sticks of a needle, and I'll get out even faster. Just I am talking to you. I've also had I, I had a wound where I needed four staples, and I didn't get a lot of things on the I didn't feel the first two, the, the, the third, fourth, the first one fell, but I'm going to have a sticky wound when I became a wound. So it's totally up to I, I usually, most patients will just do staples in my experience. I'll have the conversation with them. I can, I can, in my, my experience, my experience is very generalizing. I'll say I can stick you with a needle and then not probably can just do staples. Um, I'll give them the option. Last thing to write this this picture is a good one, obviously, the cut and cross over like that too. But normally, right, if we're doing the around, we're starting in the middle and dividing everything by half. But if you have a cut that goes through a tattoo, you should start with the tattoo lines. If you want to try to line that tattoo up as best you can, those are the ones I actually love doing the most because if you do a really good job and you can preserve that patient's tattoo, their artwork on their body, they really appreciate it. So that's the one time that we can kind of deviate into what you're in your work for. Okay, so learning points the goal of laceration care is you want to decrease the risk of infection, minimize scar formation, and good functional closure. High pressure irrigation and debridement is going to be your most important steps for reducing infection. Blast is rare, but if it happens, you want to treat it quickly with ACLS, Caesar control with benzos, and lipid emulsification therapy. Um, and then resources find, you know, it seems like laceration repair is very provider dependent. So find whatever works best for you and, you know, stick with that. There's something called the suture app, which is on the right, where you can like put in the details of your laceration and they will give you a repair recommend, re, repair recommendation with like what material to use and what type of stitches to use and then what like uh, post-op care you would need.